Good morning. Good morning. It's a joy it is once again to be in the house of the Lord. We're so glad that you are with us today, especially on this day, Communion Sunday. It's always a joy to celebrate and to remember the amazing gift that God gave us in Jesus the Christ as he died on the cross to save us from our sins and to give us new life through the resurrection. As we gather, we just want to share some of the ministry opportunities. Uh, uh, one of them is a, a good opportunity in terms of in the fellowship room. There are some baked goods and I think maybe a few extra apple dumplings. And if you didn't, weren't able to pick up your apple dumplings yesterday, uh, you can head over there and uh, get the ones that you purchased. And uh, uh, so if you have opportunity, uh, go buy some more baked goods, some more sweet stuff, and uh, enjoy them. Uh, also remember that uh, next week is the deadline for Operation Christmas Child. And so when you uh, come in, uh, go ahead, like uh, uh, someone did this morning, put the uh, shoebox right there on the front steps, and uh, we will then, in that following week, take them uh, to where they need to be so that they can eventually get to the children. And so please remember that if you uh, need another box, there's more uh, pre-printed boxes in the lobby as well as the brochures for them. Also on the table, you'll also find another, a, a different uh, flyer related to the World Mission Offering. Uh, World Mission Offering is an offering that supports our international um, missions and ministries. And so I encourage you to uh, pick up another flyer, a different flyer, which gives a more of a specific story about one of our missionaries. And again, continue to prayerfully consider what you might give to this valuable and important offering. Uh, envelopes will be on the table starting next week, and you can pick one up and either uh, give that day or take it home and then bring it back in a subsequent week. Also remember, today is also the day we emphasize, at least, uh, receiving our communion offering, an offering that helps those in our community uh, with a variety of needs, and uh, one of the major things we give out, of course, are gift cards, but we help in other ways as well. So if you have an opportunity, uh, to give to that, encourage you to do so. And also on the table is a um, green form uh, reminding you that we're uh, now we are printing a hard copy of the announcements, uh, ministry opportunities that I send out by email. So if you prefer to get a hard copy from us, you can pick up one of those as well. And hopefully, because it is Communion Sunday, you can also pick up a communion kit because uh, later on in the service you, of course, will need that. Let's at this time go to God in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we thank you.
celebrate communion, we do want you to cleanse us, to take the coals and put them on our lips. For we know, as Isaiah said, we are an unclean people. We are a people who sin. And we live among a people who also sin. And God, we need to examine our lives. We need to come into your presence, seeing that you are a holy God and that we are unholy. So God, in this moment, we want to examine our lives and confess our sins.
widespread criticisms of the church is that we are a judgmental people. That we are a people that try to impress and impose our values and our beliefs on others. That we have a tendency often to get into other people's business. And they tell us to get out of their business. George Barna has a, a group of individuals, an agency that does a variety of polls. It's a Christian organization. And one of the recent polls, they revealed that 78% of Americans believe that the evangelical church is the most judgmental segment of American culture and society. And as you know, because you've experienced it, often this happens when we are speaking out against those things that we know God calls sin and those things that are outrageous to God. And we get that finger pointed at our face, you are so judgmental. You see, we live in a culture and a society that really isn't that much different than it was in the days of the judges. You remember in the Bible, when in the days of the judges, it said that each person did what they saw fit and right in their own eyes. And that is exactly our culture today. Everyone is doing what they see and feel and believe is right in their own eyes, and they are doing it because they believe that there are no absolutes. There are no strict, regular laws that always existed and always continue to follow. And so they live their lives just doing what they feel right, and if it doesn't infringe on somebody else, they keep doing it because, after all, that's the way it's done. And the today's world is that we need to be tolerant. We need to be tolerant of one another. And, and back in the day, when I was growing up, that was what was being told too, but the, the definition of tolerance has changed. Back in the day, to be tolerant kind of was defined by being people who would agree to disagree. In other words, when we were tolerant of somebody else, we did not agree with them, we maybe even thought what they were doing was wrong, but we agreed to just allow them to do what they were doing. We would disagree, but we would still walk side by side in tolerance. Today, that is not the definition of tolerance. Today, to be tolerant of somebody else now is to accept what they are doing, to accept it as right, and even to celebrate it, even if you don't agree with it. And so there's a whole new way of looking at tolerance today. And it's even creeping into the church. Listen to this scenario. Good morning. Welcome to the Church of. May I help you? Yes. What exactly is the name of your church? Whatever you want it to be. You're just the Church of blank? Yes. Names with words like the cross or God offend people. You'll find our beliefs are very tolerant. In fact, we've removed everything from the Bible that might be offensive. See? This pamphlet is your Bible? Did you keep anything? Oh, yes. Love one another, God is love, the seven suggestions. You mean the Ten Commandments? Oh, commandments are so intolerant. People are offended. Don't you think God is offended when you change his word? God is tolerant. He'll understand. I don't think so. He wasn't very tolerant of Sodom and Gomorrah or of the world when he sent the flood. Oh, we've eliminated those events from our Bible. Listen, God wants what's best for us. Ignoring his moral standards doesn't change his expectations of us, regardless of how offensive we find them. Oh, sorry if I've offended you. Don't worry about me. It's God you need to be concerned about. Tolerance. And we know churches who have, are like that. They're fitting into the world, and, and the authority of the Bible is now being questioned. And the Bible is now being judged and looked at and interpreted based upon today's culture. And so when we speak out, then we become judgmental. We become narrow-minded. We become people who are goody-goody. And even sometimes now we're learning that sometimes when we speak out against certain things in society and certain sins, we are in fact using hate speech. Judgmental Christian. And some people who have a little glimpse of the Bible or some understanding of the Bible or read about the Bible somewhere on the internet, they will raise up to us certain scriptures 
thinking that that will persuade us in our judgmentalism. And so they will quote things like Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, where it says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. Or they will read to us or, or quote uh, some version of John 8, 7. That's a story where, you remember, the woman caught in adultery was brought to Jesus by the Pharisees. And they will quote to us this. If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And so therefore they say, see, even Jesus said, you shouldn't judge. Of course, what they don't realize, because they have not studied the scripture, is that both of those quotes, when they use them, are taken totally out of context. In the context of both of those stories and both of those sayings, Jesus is talking against the hypocritical, self-righteous judgment by the Pharisees. The Pharisees who thought they were righteous and they were sinless, and everybody else were sinners, and that was their judgment. And Jesus is talking against that type of judgment, that type of hypocrisy. Paul talks about that too in the book of Romans. And gives the same type of teaching in Romans 2, 2-3, to three, what he wrote. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think? You will escape God's judgment. There is Paul saying the same thing that Jesus is saying in the context of what he said it. In other words, that we need to be not doing what we're saying they are doing wrong either. And that's that hypocrisy. And so when we come to judging, if you will, or sharing with somebody there what they are doing wrong, we need to make sure it's not hypocritical and self-righteous. We need to make sure that we are not doing the same thing. That's the context. That's what Jesus is emphasizing. That's what he is saying. If we do make any judgments, we need to not do it hypocritically in, in a self-righteous way. And so that's the type of judgment we definitely must avoid. Hypocritical, self-righteous judging of other people, their behavior, their activities, their sins. But there's also another judgment that often is made, and we need to make sure we avoid this one as well. And that is when we judge a person's salvation. And we see that again, often in the church. A person will look at a, another person's behavior, what they are doing, their activities. And if that person proclaims at least to be a Christ follower, the statement then is this. Well, I don't think they are. How can they do that and still be a true Christ follower? And so a judgment is made upon a person's salvation. That type of judgment also needs to be avoided because only God knows the heart. It may be true that that person is doing something that God abhors, a sin that God does not like. But to judge their salvation, you see, that person may be a prodigal son or daughter who are saved, but yet they are now going down the wrong road. And so our judgment may be that they are not living a Christian life, but our judgment is never to be whether or not they have made a profession of faith. That is between them and God. And only God can make that judgment. And so we need to be careful that we don't fall into hypocritical, self-righteous judging of others and their behavior. And we also need to make sure we do not judge a person's place. In salvation. Having said all of that, there is, however, something that we do judge, that we do discern, that we do and must, in fact, determine if something is good or something is evil. And that even includes the behavior, the words, the activities of another person. We must look at their life and determine is what they are doing according to God's will, or is it contrary to God's will? Is it something God would want them to do, or is it a sin? And the first reason we need to make those judgments is not to find fault with them, but rather to determine whether we should follow their example. 
And so, when we see somebody doing something, a person who maybe professes to be a believer in Christ, and we see them doing a behavior, we need to judge as to whether we believe that behavior is sinful or whether it is not. And if it is sinful, we then need to make sure that we don't follow them into that same sin. That is a judgment we must make. We must determine and judge and discern between that which is right in God's sight and that which is not. Once we have done that, however, to protect ourselves, to guard ourselves, then there's a next step. But that first step is something that Jesus clearly taught. Later on, there in Matthew 7, keeping the context of that first verse, in Matthew 7, 15, Jesus said, Watch out for the false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you recognize them. That's what Jesus is saying. And that's what I was saying earlier. That when we see somebody doing something, we need to first determine whether what they are doing is right or wrong so we can know whether we follow them or not. But once we have determined that, and let's say we have determined that what they are doing is wrong and we're guarding ourselves so we don't fall into that, the next step is that we then need to, out of love, help them to turn around from that sinful behavior. They are heading in the wrong direction. We are not going to follow them in that direction, but we, out of our love, need to help them turn around and come back into the direction of God. That is the loving response out of a judgment or a discernment based upon their behavior. Listen to this scenario. Mail's here, ma'am. Oh, thank you. I, I think I saw your son playing in the street. Oh, okay. Well, aren't you going to tell him to stop playing in the street? What? Restrict my little Bobby? He has the freedom to do whatever he feels like doing. But there are cars driving by, big trucks. He shouldn't play in the street. That's his choice. Who are you to judge his actions anyway? Ma'am, I'm concerned about your boy. He could get hurt. Don't you impose your values on me. It's judgmental people like you that need to realize that not everyone lives by your standards. Don't you care about your little boy? Of course I do. I always support his decisions and would never dream of judging him. Sometimes the most loving action is to show someone that what they're doing is wrong. If a friend is making harmful choices, do you care enough to let them know? So out of our love for people, we need to help them turn away and turn around from the sin that they're engaging in. And that's exactly what James talks about in the last two verses of his letter. Today we're concluding our study in the book of James. And if you have your Bible handy, I encourage you to turn with me to James chapter 5, verses 19 to 20. James chapter 5, verses 19 to 20, where James wrote this. My brothers, and we can add sisters, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. As James closes his letter, he tells each of us, it is anyone among you, if anyone that you know is wandered away from the truth, that they are falling into error, that they are falling into some kind of sin, what we need to do is to love them so much that we will help them turn around. That word in the King James, I believe, is translated to convert, to turn them around from the direction that they are heading, which is wrong and an error, to turn them back around towards God. That is our loving response that we should make to others. Now, the commentators divide, I don't want to say debate, but they divide on who these people are. Some commentators believe that the people that James is talking about are true Christ followers who are now in backsliding, kind of the prodigal son, prodigal daughter type of story. That these are true Christ followers who are now falling into egregious sin that we need to turn them back around to doing God's will. Other commentators believe that these are people who claim to be true Christ followers, 
but really aren't. And what we're what James is talking about is actually converting them, giving them salvation, so that they are non-believers, although they claim in the church to be believers, they are heading in the wrong direction. We need to convert them, we need to save them and turn around. Whichever way you decide, whichever commentator you decide, or maybe it's maybe James had in mind both of these types of individuals. Whichever it is, what we have here are people who are sinning, people who are in error, people who are not following the truth, who need to turn around and come back to the truth, come back to a relationship with Jesus the Christ. How do we do that? How do we help people turn around and not be judgmental? in our doing so. We need to follow the example of Jesus himself. You see, John chapter 1 tells us the way that Jesus met people. It says there that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld the fullness of his grace and truth. You see, we're pretty good with the truth part. We read the Bible. We read, we shall not murder, and so we make a judgment. If you murder somebody, that's a sin. If you steal, that's a sin. If you meddle in someone's life, that's a sin. Remember that. Remember James and Peter, they talk about bad sin, murder, stealing, and even meddling. Gossip, lying, slander, hatred. We're great at knowing the truth, but the problem that we have, what makes us judgmental, is we forget to add grace, to add love, to add charity, to add compassion. But that's what Jesus did. And he is our example, that he spoke the truth, but always with grace. And so I have five things that I want us to look at quickly. Five things, five ways, if you will, that we can follow Christ's example by proclaiming the truth with grace. And the first is that we need to focus on the heart. We need to focus on the heart and not focus on the mind. When we focus on the mind, what we're trying to do is win an argument. Win an argument by rational thought, by reasoning, by throwing the Bible at them and saying, hey, what you're doing is wrong. You should not be doing that. What we need to do, though, is change our focus from presenting an argument and putting them on the defensive, instead to begin to focus on the heart. Because it's really the heart of the matter that is the problem. It's what's going on in our heart, which then, in fact, informs the mind. Jesus says that. It's not what goes into the person that's the problem or defiles them. It's what comes out of their heart that's the problem. The heart is where things start. The heart then influences the mind, and then the mind then moves into behavior and thought and, and, and words. We need to start with the heart. And what are we looking at when we talk about the heart? We're talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where we need to start. A person may be doing all kinds of sin. The problem is not the sin. That's the symptom. The problem is their heart. And the example we have is when Jesus went in the hot heat of this day at noon, sat by Jacob's well, and waited for the Samaritan woman to come and grow water. What Jesus did not do was quickly jump on her and say, hey, you're sitting. You're living with someone now who's not your husband, and you've had five husbands before. You've got to change. That's not what Jesus did. He did not engage even with her in her argument about worship. Should we worship here or Jerusalem? Where should we worship? You know, Baptist church, Methodist church, Presbyterian, where should we worship? He didn't engage in that. What did he start with? He went from the mind, he started with the heart, and he said, what you need is living water. What you need is a relationship with me. Because when we have a relationship with Christ, when we value that relationship, when we have a dynamic relationship with Him, that then influences our mind and our behavior. And so instead of starting with someone's sin, 
So, what, why, why are you doing this? Why are you so bitter? Why are you so angry? Why are you doing this? We need to start with, so how's your relationship with Jesus Christ? That's where we begin. Whether it's for a backsliding true believer in Christ, to bring them back into that relationship, or whether it's someone who's not a believer in Christ, we need to first give them the living water of Jesus. So we need to first focus on the heart, not on the mind. Secondly, we need to partner with the Holy Spirit. We need to partner with the Holy Spirit because we can't change anyone's mind. We can't change anyone's heart. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And partly, that is because we're working against a power greater than ourselves, but a power that is not greater than the Holy Spirit. Paul talks about that power, which is Satan. He said, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age, that's Satan, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan is blinding people. And only the Holy Spirit can remove the blinding. Only the Holy Spirit can heal their spiritual eyes so that they can see Jesus Christ. All we can do is present Jesus Christ to them. And that's where we need to start. We need to start with the heart. To present Jesus the Christ to them. We need to partner with the Holy Spirit. We need to be on our knees when we see sin in someone's life. We need to be praying for them. We need to be involved in their lives in terms of a relationship with them. We need to be showing them the love of Christ. We need to give them Jesus and allow the Holy Spirit then to work in their life to bring about that relationship which will eventually inform their mind and their behavior their actions. Thirdly, with these things in mind, we need to stop yelling at them. We need to stop yelling at people. And sometimes we actually do that physically. Actually, there are times that you know, you've had conversation with some people you know well, and you almost become yelling at them. Oh, why don't you get it? Stop doing what you're doing. Sometimes, though, we're not yelling at them but they feel like we're yelling at them. The way we're coming at them. And they'll say, stop yelling at me. And you say, I'm not. I'm using a calm voice. But your words are yelling at them. And they become defensive. And they're like, stop. Paul said this in Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth <coughs> in love. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. We need to speak the truth, but we need to do it in love. We need to do it in grace. We need, need to do it with compassion. A saying that is not in the Bible, but a good one that goes, you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. We need to ask the Spirit to help us choose the right gracious, loving words and tones instead of yelling at people and putting them on the defensive. And then fourthly, we need to approach people with a gentle humility. There's only one time that I know of in the Bible where Jesus actually describes his own character. He talks about himself in a variety of ways, that he's divine, that he's God, that he's come to preach. But there's only one time that I know that he actually described his own character. And he said this, recorded in Matthew 11, 29. He says, For I am gentle and humble of heart. We need to be gentle and humble in heart. And that is not what a judgmental Christian is. A judgmental Christian is anything but gentle and humble. They are, in fact, arrogant and hostile. And we need to be the exact opposite. We need to mirror Christ. We need to be gentle and humble in our own spirit as we relate to those around us. Because a judgmental person says, I am better than you. I am more educated. I am more spiritual. I would never get myself into the mess that you got yourself into. That's what a judgmental person says. 
that's not what Jesus did. You remember Jesus, you know, God, the Son of God, the, the sinless one, the one who never sinned, the perfect one, the righteous one? He very well could have gone to the publican, to the, the sinner, to the tax collector, to the adulterer, to, and said, hey, you're doing horrible things. But that's not how he went in love. He was the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, but he went and he ate with them and he sat with them in order to bring them that living water, in order to give them the bread of life, to, in order to lighten their darkness with the light of the world. And that's what we need to do. We need to go humbly and gently because we're as messed up as they are. It's only by the grace of God we are not where they are. We are sinners saved by grace. And yet, we continue to sin ourselves every day. We are no better than they are. We just have what they also need. And so we need to give them what we do have, Jesus the Christ. And that's what Jesus said. He talks about that humble, gentle spirit, once again back in that context of Matthew 7, where he says, before you take that little speck, that little sin out of your neighbor's eye, you need to take that beam, that four by four in your own eye. We need to first get rid of our sin and work on our sin so that we can then help others. Which brings us to the last point. We need to help others. We need to be helpers. Did you ever notice that judgmental people rarely help? But helpers are rarely judgmental. We need to help people who are going down the wrong path into that relationship with Jesus Christ. And again, that's what Jesus said in Matthew 7. He says, after we take that two by four out of our own eye, but after we deal with our own sin and work through that and, and allow the Holy Spirit to move in our lives, then we must go and help. go gently and humbly as we go to hell. <clears throat> Not as self-righteous hypocrites like the Pharisees, but rather as people, fellow sinners, fellow strugglers in life, as we are all seeking to do God's will, even in the midst of falling short every day. And so, sin does happen. It happens to people we know. And we are called to help. We are called to reach out. We are called to be people who are helping others get on that right path. Let us do so following Jesus' example. In gentle humility. Helping them get back into God's will. Let us pray. Holy gracious God, we thank you for the joy of being able to study the book of James, and he closes with a, a wonderful encouragement to us that there are people around us in the church and outside the church who, first of all, need Jesus the Christ, need the power of the Holy Spirit helping them as they seek to live according to God's will. God, help us not to be judgmental, but rather help us in love and humility and gentleness to first show people Jesus the Christ. And help them as they renew their mind, change their mind, transform their mind into your mind and the mind of Christ. We give you praise and we will give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, committing ourselves to changing our own hearts into the mind and heart.
judgmental side of our own lives and do that which Christ calls us to do, to love as we live. I encourage you to take communion kit. We are reminded that Jesus indeed was full of truth and grace. That indeed he came to live and to show us how to live. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread that was on the table. He broke it and blessed it and gave it to his disciples. Let us pray for the bread. Holy God, we thank you and praise you for this bread. A reminder of Jesus' own body, sacrificially giving to us his life on the cross. He who was without sin came to be sin for us, to take on our sin, to pay our penalty. God, help us to remember what he did for us, giving us also the example that we too must sacrifice for others, that we might help them live the Christian life. God, if we partake of the bread, may we remember what Jesus Christ did for us. body of Christ given to you, eat. After the supper, Jesus also took the cup that was on the table. He blessed it and gave it to his disciples as well. Let's pray for the cup. Holy and gracious God, we thank you also for the cup. Reminding us of the shed blood that Jesus poured out on the cross for us. For the forgiveness of sins that we might have new life, abundant life, and eternal life. As we partake together, let us remember Jesus shed blood for us, which cleanses us from all iniquity. 